16th, we will have the food pantry from 12 to 2. Uh, it's an important thing here. You'd be surprised, probably the most phone calls I answer when I'm here during the week is when is the food pantry open and what do they do? So if you can help with that or would like to help with that, get with your you know, they work at that tirelessly. And quite frankly, they are tired. And uh, they need your support and prayer and your help if you can give it. <coughs> All right, on the 18th, we will have the men's breakfast for those of you whose wives won't either cook for you or they bring you burnt offerings because they love you. Um, that'll be here. Uh, starts at 8 o'clock. On the 19th, next Sunday, we will have a business meeting. This will be the second announcement. We announced it Wednesday. Uh, so we will have a business meeting following right after church. Um, on the 20th will be the Brotherhood at Cowboy Church. Gentlemen, again, another chance to get a meal. Uh, the 23rd, 24th, that's the Thanksgiving holidays. Hard to believe we're already here, isn't it? And then we finally have, we have tent makers on the 28th. Are you going to still do it for the holidays? Okay. Um, also, as far as prayer requests go, be in prayer for me. I'll be traveling this afternoon. I'll be heading to uh, Sherman, Texas. And from Sherman, Texas, I'll be traveling back down to Euless tomorrow. Uh, I will be attending the Southern Baptist Texas Convention on behalf of North Creek Baptist Church. Uh, so I will need your prayers. So I'll be back Tuesday evening. Uh, if there's any emergencies, if you need to get anything done, please contact Dwayne and his phone number is in the phone book. Or, on, or rather the bulletin. So that's probably in the phone book, but do we even have phone books that really are in one? <laughs> Interesting. I haven't even thought about that. That's okay. So those are our announcements. Are there any other announcements that need to be made in regards to just plain old announcements? No? There are no birthdays. There are no anniversaries. So that takes care of that. None is greedy again. Um... Well, with that, let's stand and uh, sing a couple of songs and we'll get on with our business. <laughs> Bye. 
weird. But Laura's going to play God Bless America, and I don't think there's anything we should stand for that. Go ahead, Tom. Well, bless you, Heavenly Father. I ask the blessing upon this offering we're about to receive. And Father, we ask you to watch over our pastor this morning. <clears throat> Step in behind the cross and let your Holy Spirit speak through him. Yes, Lord. And Father, for this song that's coming up, Father, we just lift, ask you to watch over all the veterans of this war. Mm-hmm. And give them a special blessing, Daddy. In Jesus' glorious name, bless this offering. Amen. Amen. Amen.
and uh, he told me, he says, you're going to have to leave. My wife's got to fix me lunch. She said, all right, uh, but I'd like for you to meet my husband. We'll talk about that some other time. So I fixed his lunch. And lo and behold, we sat him down eating, and he got upset and jumped up, flew the table, all the food. And I said, why'd you do that? He said, you don't know how to cook. And I said, I thought it was okay. No, it wasn't. He said, but there's something I'm going to tell you, and that's it. Don't do that again. Don't have anybody in this house. And I said, okay, I won't. So three months later, <coughs> I started having morning sickness. And my mother told me, she said, when you have morning sickness, you got to go to the doctor. And he told me, he says, you are pregnant. You're going to have a little boy. I said, okay. So I went home and started getting things ready for him to come home. He come in really mad. I mean mad. He said, what did I tell you? And I said, well, I went to the doctor today and found out we're going to have a son. And he said, no, no, that can't happen. And I said, well, it's going to. And I turned around to go in and start putting stuff on the table. And he hit me square in the back. I mean, I went down. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, because you didn't listen. I did. I just went to the doctor. He said, don't talk back to me. Okay, fine. So he said, well, since you're going to have a baby, we might as well go get some clothes for that baby. Well, okay. So I had to go down the steps. We got halfway down, and he pushed me. I lost that baby. And I couldn't believe he did that. It's a baby. Why would you want to do that? And he said, because you didn't listen. So we moved from there closer to the bus. And uh, we lived in a duplex. I'm not supposed to meet my neighbors. At all. So I didn't. He came home. Well, we'd been there, let's say, about four months. He came home and told me that he was going out to sea. Okay. All right. He says, I'm going to send you home to your mother's in Oklahoma. I said, okay, that's fine. So I got there, and I started having morning sickness. And I said, oh, no, no. My mother asked me, she said, what's wrong? You seem quiet. So now this, when you find out, you're, you're going to have another baby? Well, I did find out. And this time, it was a dog. So he came back. She was born while he was gone. She's born in 68. And he came back, and he was real happy. He had a daughter. And I thought he had changed. We went back to San Diego, and we were there for quite a while. And when she was nine months old, sitting in the little walker by him. He was filling out a sympathy card. And he went and got a stamp to put on the card. And my daughter had chewed a corner of the sympathy card. He 
He was so mad, he cupped his hands and slapped her across her right ear. He broke her eardrum. And I know, and I'm telling y'all this, I know in my heart God gave me the strength to pick him up and throw him against the wall and put my fist under his chin. I said, get out now. While he was gone, they called the show patrol. They picked him up. And a lieutenant came to my house and he said, you're leaving on the next plane. We're taking you to the airport. Oh, I was so happy. I was. When I got there, I wanted to get a lawyer. And I did. And he came back because they told him he had to go back because he was going to have to go to court. He didn't know why. They found out. So we all went to the court that day. And he brought his sisters with him. And he told them, <coughs> do what I told you. So the judge called him up first. He said, I want to ask y'all something. He said, what was she like when you were with her? And she said, she's fine, you know. And he, and he then they started looking at the brother. Judge says, all right, I know where this is going. He said, they said, Mrs. Roman, stand up. He said, you got custody of your daughter. And he only gets eight years. Okay. I wasn't happy with that, but that went on for about three weekends. He come back following weekend and I opened the door and my little girl crawled under a new table. She said, no, no. And I went to the door and I says, leave now. And they never came back. I took him back to court. He lost his weekend. I was never so happy until you don't hurt your kids. And this was in 69. I met my second husband. Now he's in the Air Force. My sister, my middle sister, Virginia, and her husband, Don, asked me to go voting at Tinkerer. Air Force voting, voting at it. And I did. And we were having a real good time. And he came in and he was sitting up at the bar watching what we were doing. And my sister said, it's your time, Paul. Get up. So I did. And I threw that ball down there. And the bar was still there. It came back up. So he comes over and he says, I think you need some lessons. <laughs> so I'm okay with that. And so we all go to bed for a while. <coughs> and we got ready to leave. My uh, John asked, says, can I take her home? And Don says, ask her. She's old enough. told me how he got divorced. He came home from Vietnam on Valentine's Day. Now, I want y'all all to remember Valentine's Day, okay? And uh, 
without knowing and saying. And we went back to the station still at the Dread Horse Base. They got us a little house on the base. And this is where my son was born. And we were all happy. I mean, really happy that he was born, you know. And later on, he came home and told me, this has been three years, we got sent to Delta, Missouri. Every three years, we got moved. <laughs> so, I like that. We've been there almost six months, and my ex lives down with us. He came in, came way home, the kids were outside playing, and he came straight back into the living room. I said, is that you, John? And he says, you'll find out who it is in a minute. He came in to our bedroom, and he said, I told you I was going to get even with you for what you did, taking my daughter away from me. I told him, I didn't do it. He did, because Wayne hit her, and he didn't get very much out. My husband came home and grabbed him by the back of the leave and never come back. <coughs> he left and he never came back. My husband came in to me and he said, how did he know where we lived? I said, what do you mean, sir? He knows how to find people. He said, okay, I understand. So we were there a little longer than three years. Arizona. But we went back to Kansas. And uh, we were there only two months. We got everything together and we moved to Tucson, Arizona. Now this is where my second son was born, in Tucson, Arizona. So this all your fault. I said, how can this be my fault? And he said, it is your fault. You know it is. I'm leaving that alone. He said, I'm going on night at the base. I said, okay. But in the daytime, he cried every hour on the hour. He told me to get in the car and take our son out. So he went to sleep. I did that. I did that for so long that I was tired of it. He came home one day and he says, we're getting stationed in Sacramento, California. This one? So we went there. We were there. Maybe four, five months. And my little girl, Susan, she was walking around while I was cooking. I pulled the oven door down and she wanted to see what was in there. He was right behind her and he pushed her hand down on the oven door and she burnt her arm. So why did you do that? She just wanted to see if it was hot. No, 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 this is not going to happen. So we got moved again into a different place on base. And then 
things have come, he said. You're going to have to go to work. And she said, okay, that's fine. She said, because you've got to pay me back all that money you spent. I said, what money? She said, you'll find out. Yeah. I said, okay. And we were doing some hard things. In 69, Later on, let's just say that. <laughs> Later on, she says, I'm getting out of the service. She said, we're moving to Houston. <coughs> we're going to live with mom and dad, his mom and dad. I said, okay, that's fine. So we moved in with them, and things were doing really good until John's daughter, one of them went and told Grandma that Susan had called her a bitch. That would never happen. My daughter never did that. And we moved from there close to Sugar Land, Texas. And he was a male kid. Things just kept getting worse and worse. My daughter, my son, they went to school together. And his daughter, they all went to school. And they came home. Susan was walking with the little girl and two boys. And I'm not going to say this word. I'm just going to give you a word, a letter. He called her and said, you little dummy, get in this yard. I heard that. And I went out and said, why did you just call my daughter? He said, oh, you already know. We're the same. I said, oh, no. No. I called my mother up and I went home and told her what happened. And she said, I will be there this weekend. I lost my daughter again. They took, my mother took her out. I didn't get to raise her. My mother raised her. So that went on for quite a while. And then John said, you can stop working now. We're moving. And I said, well, where are we moving? Intervale, Texas. You're going to work to pay me back all the money you spent. Okay, I'll do it. So I went to work. And I come home, and this was in 2012, which I remember. We were sitting down watching the news, and John asked me, he said, where were you when I called you at work and you weren't there? I said, if I was on duty, I'm at work. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time. So he said, where were you when I called you at work and you weren't there? And I said the same thing. He slapped his hands down on his arm of his chairs and he jumped up grabbed my shoulders and was like a vice grip. He wouldn't let go. I looked straight into his eyes. They were cold black and his face was dark red. Now I know what that is. And he slung me around and I said, stop this. This is not right. And he slung me right across my jaw. And that was it. I couldn't believe it. I fell real hard. I hurt my knee. And I crawled to the kitchen to grab the iron. I pulled myself up. And he 
was right there beside me, chasing me around that island. I couldn't hold on to the island much longer. I yelled at him, stop, this is not right. And I grabbed the phone, I picked it up. I was gonna call the sheriff's office. And he grabbed my wrist and he was like, just squeezed them constantly. I threw the phone down. He says, if you ever call the sheriff's office on me, I'll kill you. I will kill you. So he, he went outside. And he came back down later. And he told me, he says, I'm going to see you in the front door. That's fine. But he went into our bedroom first. I followed him. We started getting all these clothes out of the closet and we went into the first bedroom. We came back in, went in the bathroom and got all this stuff. Then we tied my necklace to it that he got me for Christmas. He said, is this your lover's? I said, no, you got that one for me for Christmas. He threw it at me. It was glass. If I had any dust, it had hit my hand. And the next morning, I got up and fixed coffee, and he came into the kitchen, and I asked him, do you want any breakfast? And he said, no, B, it's going to trip my breakfast. And I said, okay, all right. So we went out the door. Call my son in Missouri. I told him everything. He says, Mom, pack your bags. You're coming home to live with us. And I, I was feeling where I couldn't breathe. My tongue was getting swollen. My jaw was really sore. And I said, heck with this. I just went into town and I went to the bank. And the lady that saw me said, did your husband do that to you? And I said, yes. And she said, get down to the sheriff's office now or you may never have a chance again. Mm -hmm. So I went down there and I filled out the warrant for his arrest. And they took me to the hospital. My jaw was broke. I have to have this surgery on my knee. I was badly bruised, everything. And they told me, don't go back to him. Well, he was put in jail for three months for this. And I am sitting in the back there while I was in the safe house. And they gave him a motel room to stay in. And uh, when Stephen picked me up, he said, Mom, if you don't get a divorce, there's something wrong with you. So, um, They had to go back to Missouri because their eldest was in the school. I stayed. I shouldn't have. I really shouldn't have stayed, but I did. And John called me from the jail. He was crying. He said he was sorry, and I took him back. Don't ask me why I did, but I did. And uh, he said, let's give our land to the kids, and we'll do some harvest. And I said, okay, that's fine with me. <coughs> and he called our oldest. He says, I want nothing to do with y'all, nothing. That's it. And he called my son in Missouri, and he says, 
all present. So thank you, Mr. Scott, for being here for me and our team. And Ms. Freedom, who's been the truck driver, who came home with us on Valentine's Day. He came over to our home. And John was sitting there just talking. And with Stephen's wife was on the computer trying to fix it. And he turned to Stephen and he says, When are you going to pray, pray your brother half of what this land is worth? He said, You didn't say nothing about that. And Stephen got up and said, You've always loved my brother. So we ran out the front door. John got up, looked straight at me. I black. His face was red. And he went out to see if he could catch Stephen, but he couldn't. And when he, when I went down to talk to him, I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, it's all your fault." I said, no, nothing is my fault. It was your first wife, not me. And I don't want nothing to do with you anymore. So I went in the house. He came in. He said, I don't have any place to go. I said, okay, you can spend one night. One night. I went in my room. I kept my eye on his door. I got up. He got some coffee and went out on the porch. And I said, oh, no, this is not happening again. I got all <coughs> my keys off of his keys. I went to the door. I slammed the keys at him. And I said, get off my land right now. He said, that ain't yours. It's all mine. I said, get out. sold it on and saw it. Yeah. And I was so happy then. I'm telling you that was peace out there. Yeah. And everybody keeps asking, when are you going to get married again? <laughs> no. And believe me, I'm so glad it happened. Cancer is cancer. But the Lord took it out. And I'll tell you what, right now, He took it out. And He has done that for me and through me. And I am so glad that I don't have to wake up and hear somebody yelling at me every day. I know it's not fun, and that's why I don't even want to think about another marriage, because my body just will not take it. Amen. I have kept anyone Stephen, Tony, I gave him a bed, the bed, and that double wide bed for me. And on my husband's side was a loaded pistol. Mm -hmm. He could have killed me any time he wanted to. Mm -hmm. But the Lord didn't want him to. And I'm here.
preaching Psalm 46 three weeks ago, I had no idea that I'd be preaching a series of messages that are on us taking our place, our faith, our trust, our refuge in God. But God had a different plan because now I'm on my third message in line with this. In your little notebook here, this little piece of paper, I hope you underline these verses in your Bibles. God is our refuge and our strength in Psalm 46.1. Last week I preached in 1 Thessalonians 5.24. What a statement. Faithful is he who calls us. And he will also do it. This morning we're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3. And just as... Paula's testimony, dark and heavy as it began and was, the light shone at the end for what God had done for her. <coughs> and in the same way this morning, this message in Jeremiah starts out dark and the light shines through. <coughs> and so I didn't realize when I had prepared this message that our community as a whole would be hurting. Two people died in this community that many, many, many people knew and loved. Rusty Tess and every last one of us has eight hip country cousins and probably ain't there for years and have known you. And then our dear brother and friend, Brent Dorman, passed away, whose funeral we had yesterday. So our community as a whole, has been struggling. Church families have been struggling. Families have been struggling. This church in particular, I can't speak for other churches, but this church has had persons sick, hurting, surgery, still in the hospital, still recovering. It seems like every week that's where I'm dealing with. And sometimes even as your pastor, you begin to feel the weight of the darkness and the heartache and the pain that goes knowing that your, your church family is hurting. And, and, and you get to the point, some of you may have read, sometimes I get to the point where I just have to say, God, I don't know what else to pray about. I just have to put my trust in you. So this morning's message, I've titled it, The Soul's Declaration. The Lord is my portion. Lamentations chapter 3. If you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word, I appreciate it. We'll begin in verse 1. We'll see the darkness through 1 through 6, and then I'll get to the main part after that. Now this book is written by Jeremiah, known as the Weeping Prophet. And folks, there has been lots of weeping going on here lately. I dare say that any of you, as you hear these words this morning, cannot say that you have not experienced this. 
So here, let's listen to what the prophet Jeremiah has to say. He says, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in the darkness and not in light. Surely against me he has turned his hand. Repeatedly all day, all the day, he has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones and he has besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. And in dark places he has made me dwell. Let us go with prayer. Father God, this is the heart sometimes here lately over the last several months. These are the hearts of families that are grieving. These are the hearts of churches that are hurting. God, sometimes we lose sight of you and we become like Jeremiah here, Lord. We say that you have made us walk in the darkness. We feel as if you have forsaken us, even though we know that is not true. We feel as if you have turned yourself towards us in your wrath. But, oh, God, that's not true. Because of your son, Christ Jesus. If only it was we could understand that it is us who has moved and not you. We have allowed circumstances to darken the light of your Son, Christ Jesus. We look to our own strength and we fail. Some, we of us, we sin and are just outright disobedient. And because of such, Lord, you say, have your own way. And let the consequences fall where they may. Father God, help us to take this portion of the message and then let us find out who you really are. Father God, I ask all this in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, please. So, the last two weeks we've heard the Lord speak from his words of immense strength and power to encourage us during our times of difficulty, both personally and personally and corporately as a church family. Two weeks ago, we heard the word of God in reference to him being our refuge and our strength. When it says, God is our refuge and strength, that is a matter of fact. It is not to be questioned. And yet, we act as if that's not true. It's a fact, people. We need to understand that. When we're hurting and when we are crying and we feel that we are in the dark, we need to say, God is my refuge. Mm -hmm. Refuge. What is that? It is a place of rest. It is like your home. When you go home, you are in your refuge. You are sitting in your comfortable chair. You are happy. You are peaceful. You are content. You feel secure. This is what we mean here. We need to be rested and feel secure and safe within God. The refuge that he provides. God is with us regardless of what's happening around us in the world. That's another issue. Not only are we having problems with our own health and the loss of loved ones, we see what's going on in this chaotic world and it worries many people. And last week we said, not only is God our strength and our refuge, what did we say in Thessalonians? Faithful is he who calls us. And what was the last half of that verse? And he will bring it to pass. Oh, to cling forth to that. And before we really get into the message, let me just make a couple of comments about faith for a moment. Faith untried may be True faith, but it is sure to be little faith and is likely to remain small so long as you are without trial. The church, whenever it has grown in its most throughout history, is when the church shed its blood and was persecuted. We are a people who don't seem to be persecuted anymore. We don't like trials and tribulations. 
But when we are tried and we trust God and he brings us through the flames, oh, how much stronger our faith is. Faith untried may be true faith, like I said, but it will be small. Faith never prospers so well as when all things are against her. Storms are her trainers, and lightning is her illuminator. No stars are as bright as in the deepest, darkest part of the night sky. No water is as sweet as the, the water that springs forth from the desert sand. Oh, but faith is so precious that, that we need it. We need that faith, but faith is precious because of trials and tribulations and adversities. Because trials and tribulations brings us experience in who God is. You know what? Without being tried, without having tribulations, you would never understand your own weakness when you were compelled to pass through the raging waters. And in that trials and in those weaknesses, if you don't have them, you will never know the strength of God and what he can do in your life as you go through the flood waters. <coughs> We've been studying Daniel's. The Bible's clear. He says, I'll be with you and I will help you to pass through the flames. And when you study Daniel, the three Hebrew children in the flames there in the midst of them was Christ, and they come unscathed. God's word is true. He will bring it to pass. Amen. Faith is precious. Faith through trials increases solidity, solidity in you, in assurance and trust in God that you will overcome the adversity that is facing your life. Faithful is he who calls you this morning. Now, here as we look at this, we believe that this man is talking to Jeremiah here. He says, I am a man who has seen affliction. Who here has not seen affliction in your life? Who has not had trials in your life this morning? Every last one of you I have prayed for one way or another because of a surgery or an illness or recovery. So we are like Jeremiah. Every last one of us has seen affliction. And if we're not careful, we can say, well, we think it's God's punishing us. And sometimes we think that God drives us to the darkness, not into the light. No, folks, that's us. When we lose sight of who Christ is in the blessed light of his magnificence, we tend to see things in our own eyes, and our eyes become darkened, as it were. Our hearts become darkened. And God says, you know what? If that's what you want, I'm going to give it to you. And he lets us go through because we fail to call upon him. And when we're in this darkness, folks, we lose our joy, we lose our peace, and we lose our happiness. He goes on. He says, listen, he has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. Look, every last one of us in here have gray hair. It ain't none of us young. We Half of us wear glasses. The other half have hearing aids. Some of us hobble and... Some of us have had multiple surgeries and probably have more screws and metal than the bionic man. Some of us, God bless Pam Stubblefield. Look, he has broken my bones. Her hip broke. And she had to have surgery. Now, I'm not saying that's because of sin by her. But I'm saying, listen, how true this is within our own church body. And we say that we feel besieged. We feel encompassed by bitterness and hardship. And we say, oh, God's put us in a dark place. No, he hasn't. He's just waiting for you to call on him. He's just waiting for you to call on him. And then, in the midst of all of this darkness, and this prophet is weeping over the death of Jerusalem. Folks, we cried and wept over the death of our beloved friends and family. We're just like Jeremiah here. He's crying over what caused him to weep over.
over the death of Jerusalem. Well, the death of Jerusalem because they were sinful and disobedient. Now, when we weep and we cry over our beloved, it's not because they sin or disobedient, but it's because of what Adam did and imputed to each and every one of us. We have a sin nature. And these things happen to us because of that. And we can get really bogged down about it. Verse 17 says, My soul has been rejected from peace, and I have forgotten happiness. Have you been there? Have you lost your peace from time to time? Have you lost your happiness? Do you feel as if your strength, as in verse 18, has perished, and that you have lost all hope in God sometimes? It's a dark place to get to. But then, let's take a look this morning. What happens? Here comes the light, people. He says, remember my affliction. We're in verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wondering and the wormwood and the bitterness. And he says, surely my soul remembers and it is bowed down within me. Boy, troubles and trials can get us bent over quick, can't they? And then listen to this. He says this. In verse 21, if you want to start underlining something, this I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. In what? The Lord's loving kindness in verse 22. Indeed, it never ceases. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thomas and I were talking to you. This is where that song came from. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And then we get to verse 24. Oh, you need to just hug onto this one. It says that the Lord is my portion, says my soul, to the person who seeks him. I want to get to this in particular because this is our focus board uh, verse. He states it matter-of-factly again. The Lord is my portion. This idea of portion, what does it mean? It is the foundation of our relationship with Christ Jesus and God the Father. This idea, this concept of being your portion signifies that it is just not part of your life but the very source of life itself. The word portion here means inheritance. An inheritance. So it is your source of life. God is our ultimate sustainer and provider in a world that is marked by uncertainty and change. God is the unchanging, constant pressure, presence that we can rely on this morning. This idea that he is my portion is that this phrase conveys the idea that God is not merely a part of one's life, but rather he is our life. That is what we need to get to. God is not part of our life. He is our life. Do we understand that, people? The word portion, as I said, denotes the inheritance. We can take from this that God is our ultimate inheritance and our primary source of provisions for the believer. God is our ultimate inheritance. By claiming God as our portion, or their portion, the Israelites were declaring, it says, my soul declares that their wealth and their inheritance was not rooted in material things or of earthly possessions or anything like that, but it was their relationship with God through His Son, Christ Jesus. This portion is our sustainer and our provider. God is not just a distant deity, but an ever-present sustainer and provider. In times, uh, in times describing in the beginning of Lamentations, this truth becomes the source of our comfort, reassurance, and strength and peace. God is ever-present. Can you all say amen? amen? He's our ever-present. Even when we don't feel like he's here. Even when we don't think he's here. Even when we don't act 
like he's here. He's ever present. He does not move. We move. God, because of this portion, he is immutable. It is consistent. It implies that it is enduring. It is unchanging reality. In spite of the chaos in the world uh, that goes on, God's portion is always there for us. God is faithful, and this is our hope. Faithful is he who calls us. We have a relationship because of this portion. To re receive a portion means that a person's nature is the, is the nature of the relationship of God. It is deeply intimate. Do you have a deep, intimate relationship with God? How many of you, how many of you think you'd still be married if you only talked to your spouse two hours on Sunday every day? Hmm? Or your friends? Or your brothers and sisters? Whatever. What kind of relationship would that be if you only talked to them for two hours a day and listened to a man like me scream and yell at you? That's what we do. During the week, we act as if we're living on our own most of the time. We come back to Sunday and we're like, oh, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Can you hear our prayers? Can we do this? And God's like, well, where have where you been? What's going on, child? I want to talk to you. Look in the, the Garden of Eden. God's walking, it says, in the cool of the day. And he says, Adam, where are you? He wanted to have a relationship. He wanted to know what Adam and Eve were up to. Even though he's God, he knew it. He's like, where are you? He's doing the same thing today. He's asking each and every one of you, where are you? And then we all go, oh, well, I'm hiding over here because I'm, you know, the metaphorical, I'm naked fact. He wants to have a relationship with you. And this portion is eternal. The declaration of the soul encourages us to adopt an eternal perspective. This world is not our home. This body is just a tent. Our heavenly home and glorified body is yet to come where it never decays for eternity. That is our portion in God. Imagine how much better our lives would be if we just truly listened to those words and said, he's my portion. What have I to fear? I want us to look at something real quick. I'll try to go through these quick. I know it's getting late. Psalm 16, if you want to write this down. Listen, Psalm 16, starting in verse 5. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot, and the times have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. How wonderful is that? He's our inheritance. Look over in Psalm 73. Starting in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. How do we lose sight of that? How do we lose sight of that? Psalm 89. Psalm 89. You want to know how to act? You want to know how to get along beyond all this? I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. Do you go around singing praises to God all day long? Most of the time we don't sing and thank Him enough. It's always we want something, do we not? 90% of our prayers is always what we want, what we think we need, what we desire to see happen. This says, I will sing of your loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations, I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said, loving kindness to be built up forever in heaven. You will establish your faithfulness. 
I, listen, he says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. The Bible says in Peter that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, an inheritance with Christ Jesus. And we act again as if we're just poor, pitiful, defeated people. And myself included, I get that way. I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching with you. He says, I have sworn to David my servant that I will establish my seed forever. <coughs> Folks, in summary, listen. The Lord is my portion is a profound statement of faith that encapsulates our relationship with God. Our walk with, through, with him through life's difficulties. God is our ultimate inheritance. Our unwavering sustainer. And unchanging hope and purpose. This hope offers believers a firm foundation for their faith. And an outlook that transcends life's temporary challenges. Guiding us towards a deeper and a more profound relationship with God through the work of the cross, through His Son, Christ Jesus. What did He save us from? He saved us from the wrath of God. Wrath that you and I deserve. The, the wrath, the wrath that Jeremiah thought he was experiencing is absolutely nothing compared <coughs> to what the sinner will experience on the day of judgment. Right. He saved us from that if we would only call upon him. So the question is, have you done that? Have you called upon the God and make your soul declare that he is your portion? Have you placed your hope in the portion of the Lord? Is he your Savior this morning? Amen. Have you been made joint heir with Christ and received your eternal portion of hope? Oh, how's the song go? My hope is built on nothing less. <laughs> Praise God for that. Folks, I pray that Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. Faithful is he who calls us and the Lord is my portion. Brings you great comfort and brings you great strength. I don't believe I'm going to be preaching on Proverbs 18, but listen. The name of the Lord is a strong power. What does it say? The righteous run into it and are safe. You hear that? Run to God. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You're not safe outside of the strong tower of Christ Jesus. Now my, my goal and my hope and my prayer is that you will be forever able to draw upon these verses we've heard in the last three work, weeks when your life seems the darkest. And if you don't know Christ Jesus today, I pray to God that this is the day that you make that acceptance. 